All right, guys. So let's see how this audio is uh, coming in this morning. Shoot me a uh, message here if you can hear this. Let me know if it's coming out of both speakers today instead of just one. And we'll see how Open Broadcaster likes my connection. So yesterday we were doing some stuff and going through um, the LA office and then streaming to Twitch. So hopefully my connection holds and doesn't cause craziness. All right, we got stereo confirmation. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> this way, this way I can pretend to sing, which is awful, by the way, awful. All right, <clears throat> so I hope you guys have been enjoying this uh, ZBrush Live stuff. Just want to go through some things off the start here of our lineup that will be continuing today. And this is going to be a continuing thing, so this is going to be on all the time. And we're going to try to flood this with as many excellent artists as they are out there in the ZBrush world and um, just having this going constantly. So for today's agenda, we have me here, and I will be off at 8.30 a.m. So the times you're seeing here are in L.A. time. So 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. L.A. is will be me here. And as you can see, it is live with myself, and it's also featuring myself, which is a little bit strange. I, I don't know why I'm getting featured as well, but, you know. Um, later this evening at 6 p.m., we have Michael Pavlovich, and he's another excellent ZBrush artist, excellent ZBrush instructor. Um, I highly recommend uh, checking out his stream as well. Excellent stuff. You'll learn a lot in his. And then for you guys that may still have been uh, awake all night watching the people from New Zealand, they're back again. So we have John Troy Nickel, uh, and that will happen at 11.30 p.m. tonight. So if I wake up at 6.30 a.m. my time, I'll be able to catch the end of that. So crazy New Zealanders with their all time zone stuff. So that's what we have going on today. So this is scheduled time slot for here is going to be based on Ask ZBrush. So if you guys have any usage questions, you're running into anything, and I might be able to answer them. I may not. I may send you guys to the uh, support network, and I'll just pull that up here too. But this is uh, just going to be based on Ask ZBrush. So it's just another outlet where you guys can ask questions um, relating to ZBrush things, workflows, pipelines, processes, things you may run into and just can't figure it out. And so this is just an open door for you guys to ask these things. And um, I'll try to answer them as best of my knowledge. Uh, right now we have over a hundred and well, we have 157 videos for Ask ZBrush, and this is on our YouTube channel. You can also access these through our streaming portal as well. So if you come over here to this Ask ZBrush area here, they will update with the latest ones. And I usually try to get at least two of these done a week. Sometimes it goes up to five or six. It just depends on how much time I have to uh, get these things completed. But there's a whole bunch of questions here that have been answered, and they all have correlating videos that go with them. So three to five minutes on just any kind of topic, and you come through and just watch these. So if you have a problem you can't solve in ZBrush, I highly recommend you do like a Google search or just a YouTube search for what you're looking to do, and it may already be answered in the Ask ZBrush uh, video set here. Uh, let's see what else we're going to do here. We also have this on our ZBrush Central too. If you guys aren't familiar with uh, ZBrush Central, um, definitely a lot of great ZBrush art gets posted here. And we also link, try to link anything that we do in the form as well. So any sort of new things, like you can see here's ZBrush Live. Uh, the Overwatch guys at Blizzard just dumped their entire art dump on the uh, form here. And so if you guys are a fan of Overwatch, which you may also have been watching on Twitch this morning. Um, they have dumped all their high poly models here. And one thing I really enjoy is be able to put names to all these models. I've been running around Overwatch trying to get all the um, the late latest events unlocked. I still haven't got Divas and I still haven't got Maze. Those are the two I wanted. I've gotten everybody else's except for those two. <laughs> So I need to uh, get some time in in the evening this uh, next week before the event ends and see if I can get those uh, skins unlocked. But whole thread of all the ZBrush art and it's all the high poly assets. So really, really pretty stuff here. And a few of these artists um, we've had out for different trade shows and stuff. So definitely excellent artists and excellent people. So check that out. 
All right, so let's see. I'm gonna show you guys the support site here. If I can spell it. You'd think I wouldn't know how to spell this. So if you guys have a question that maybe doesn't get answered in the Ask Brush thread, because we do get a lot of them, it comes through Twitter is what we're, we've been using it. And occasionally there are questions that may get overlooked, may not get answered. So if you find anything like this that you want more information on, you can definitely submit a support ticket on the Pixelogic site here. And this site is support.pixelogic.com. Um, Put it in here, there's generally, depending if it's not a release, um, definitely you'll get a, uh, a reply to your ticket pretty fast. Um, and they will deal with any of the technical items so that you have. And so use this as a an outlet for ZBrush as well. So definitely send support tickets in if you have them. So if I don't ask you your question, answer your question, or I answer it <laughs> and you don't like the answer I gave you, um, you can definitely hit up uh, support.pixelogic.com and they'll be happy to help as well. All right, so let's switch to some ZBrush here. And I'm going to look at the chat channel here, see if we have anything. Anything going on? Any questions? No, sadly, we're, we're, not, we're not hitting on any of the far right. We're still busily working at it. So when it's done, it'll be done. And it's amazing, amazing. So how many of you guys are on the East Coast? Do we have any people on the East Coast here today? Anybody? You guys all LA people? Uh, let's see. Let's see what this UI question is. I think I have an answer for this for you. Yes. Yes. All right. So first question we got here. It's a UI question, and let me see if I can pull this up too, so you guys can see what the question is asking. This was one I was going to answer this week, but since you're here now, we can just take care of it, and I'll still probably do a uh, recorded uh, video on it as well, so that there will be a version of it inside the SC brush location. All right, so this was the question about the UI that was sent in. And here we have the question. It was, how can I change the UI elements to be smaller like in the example showing here? So the things to look at here is you have your brush menu, you have your stroke, you have your alpha, and you have your texture, and then you have your material. And then in the correlating image here, we have alpha as this very small little icon. The stroke's very small, texture's very small, and the matte cap's very small. So how can I get this in my customized interface? So let's go over to ZBrush quick here. And to do this, it's pretty simple, but it's a little kind of hidden thing. There's always all sorts of stuff that's hidden in the Preferences tab here. So I'm going to navigate up to Preferences at the top here, and I'm first going to just activate um, the custom interface stuff. So I'm going to go to Config, and I'm going to Enable Customize. And this is just going to put my customization into Customize mode, so I can come through and move things around and change my buttons. And next, I need to go to the interface area here. Now, hopefully I'm going to the right area here. This may take me a second here. And we go Preferences, Interface, UI, and in here there's this Wide Buttons uh, switch here. And what this does, if you hold down Control when you hover over any of these buttons in here, you should get a little help text that's going to pop up as well. And this is just telling you that the wide buttons are going to make interface items such as the alphas, brushes, materials twice as wide as they are tall. So if we unclick this, you're going to notice over here in the tool palette, you'll just see everything just shrank. So if I turn this on, you're going to get them this big kind of thing. So they're double width single height, and then if you turn this off, they're now going to that square format. So you're looking at the one-to-one -one kind of ratio thing there. So it's taken all those and it's made them smaller. So this is the button here that you want to click for this. And this is this wide buttons just in interface and UI. Now after you have that turned on, if we go up here to our material palette, you'll see you have the material, which is your big button, and then below it you'll have just the matte cap gray one, and this is your small button. So if I take this and hold down Control and Alt and drag it, I can now place it in my UI, and if I click this, it will now give you that same functionality 
as you have with the big button over here. And it's the same thing for the strokes. If you go to the stroke, you can see here's the tiny little dots button here, and I can drag that over. And then if I want the texture one, I can go to the texture palette here, grab that one, put it over there. And I can do this with the alpha, so all those gigantic buttons are now these tiny little buttons. And they're all going to do the same functionality as these ones over here. So that again is just go to the preferences, go to interface, and in here you have this wide buttons toggle. And then once again, to edit your UI, if you go to config, there's this enable customize, and this will allow you to enable your customize there. So does that, does that answer your question there? Yeah, we got a little bit, hold on, we're gonna have to we're gonna kill my top image here too, so you guys can see this, there we go. How's that, is that better? I turned off the overlay. We're gonna have to get that fixed. I have to have to speak to the uh, the Ask the ZBrush Live staff. Tell them the the top bar is occluding my ZBrush. <laughs> All right, so we got one from J S Morgan, and he asks, "What's the best way to export height data?" for apps like Substance. So the height data is basically done through the alpha palette. Um, let me get out of customize here. And so in the alpha tab, you have a few ways you can create alphas. So any data inside of ZBrush can be turned into an alpha, which is basically your height map. And if you just wanna make an object in here, so let's say I just have the cylinder shape, and I'm just gonna go to the Z modeler brush and add a bevel here quick. Because if you're doing uh, height maps, if you just do them black and white, they're not going to give you that nice fall off. And I'm going to add a crease as well. And we're going to crease this edge too. And if you guys aren't using the Z Modeler brush, it's amazing. Amazing. So there we have a quick little shape. So there's a few ways you can generate a height map out of here just based on objects inside of ZBrush. Uh, one way is just go to the Alpha tab here, and you can go to transfer and you can do a grab doc and this is going to grab your entire document and now turn it into an alpha so let's grab the entire thing and now i have a height map of that you can also come over here to the tool palette and i can get out of edit mode and then while i'm out of edit mode i can switch to this mrgbz grabber this is going to be a dr seuss book for sure and the mrgbz grabber because that one I just can never pronounce. Um, with this selected, you can now drag this out and hold shift to keep it square. And you can come through and position this with spacebar and just moving it around. And then when you're happy with where it's at, just release. And then that's also going to spit out a depth alpha for you. Now, if you need to get a height map out for a model, let me come through and I'll just load Earthquake here. You just need to make sure your model has UVs. So here we have Earthquake. And he has a set of UVs on him. So if we go to the Texture Map tab and go to Create New from UV Map, you can see this is what I'm getting. And to create a height map is basically going to be your displacement uh, map here. So you can select this. And then from here, you just want to make sure you're on the subdivision you want to go from to. So I'm going to just hit Shift D to go down to a lower subdivision like this one here and then I'm going to do create displacement map and this is going to process the model and generate a height map or displacement map out of that mesh so it's going to look at the subdivision you're on and it's going to calculate from starting from that subdivision to your highest subdivision and then it's going to give you a displacement off of that and so that's another way um, you can generate a uh, height map out of those things so is that answer that um, that will, will give you the two things there and but the primary function that most people use for generating height maps for tiling textures and stuff is basically going to the alpha menu, doing the grab dock here, or using that MRGBZ grabber. Um, and if you guys were turn, tuned in to the stuff um, yesterday, um, you can definitely, um, I don't think I have the plugin installed, but if you need to make tiling stuff, uh, we did, I did create that one plugin that will help with that, and you can tile stuff with nano mesh, which is really nice, and you can grab the alpha and the height map right out of there too, so handy things. All right, let's see what else we got. What else do we got? All right, so we got, let's see. Noise doesn't show up on my mesh until I apply it. What could be the reason? All right, look, these are some good ones. You guys got good questions today. Actually, it's more that they're all the questions I can answer. <laughs> 
All right, so we're going to load Mr. Earthquake in here again. So the noise is working in a variety of ways. So I'm just going to duplicate Earthquake here. I'm just going to get him plain. And I am going to delete his higher subdivisions here and turn on dynamic. So the surface noise is located on the tool palette and there's a surface option here and you can activate this and this will throw you into this little viewer. And in here you can come through and use things like the noise plug which is going to open up your noise maker window here and you can select a different range of randomly generated procedural maps for your models. So we'll go with this stripe one. And then now you can come here and adjust the strength and get this to be applied. You can change the plug-in scale on this. And you can start generating things like this. And most of the time just come in here and start messing with sliders. Um, we do have the mix basic noise, which is going to allow you to mix before and after on your mesh here. So you'll see this and that. And we also have these awesome things down here called offset, which is going to take your model and it will offset the pixel variation, which is going to allow you to create holes in your mesh, which is really cool for uh, creating different styles and stuff. You can just offset it and it's going to start culling out that black level on your mesh. And whatever pattern you have applied, it's going to look at that white and black, and then it's going to start just chopping those areas out as it goes up. So the more gradient you have, the more like procedural stuff, and then this stuff will transfer right to your model as well. So one potential reason that your noise is not potentially showing up is that it's going to look at your masking on your model. So if you have an area that's masked out, and we come back in here and turn this on. Now, magically, I'm not going to be able to get this to happen. <laughs> <clears throat> and you turn this on, um, you can see it's only going to show on masked areas. And so if you may have masking on your mesh, it may end up occluding that thing. So to make sure your mask is cleared when you're doing the noise on this, and then you'll get this. Um, layers will sometimes uh, change how this masking and how the surface noise will be affected as well. So if you have layers on your model, that could also be a, a thing that may be causing this. But in general, if you have surface noise on your mesh and it's clear of masking, you should see it. Now sometimes if your surface noise is also very low, so if you want to edit here and my strength is very low, you're not going to see it at this. Um, you may also, you see I have a color blend on here, so if you have color blend set to zero, and just depending on what material you have, it may also not allow that surface noise to be visible. Um, one good check to just make sure they don't have anything going on with your model and to make sure that it's working is to open up Lightbox here and you can go to this noise maker palette here. And in here we have some predetermined noises. So what I suggest doing is on that model that you're not getting the surface noise to show up is until you apply it is definitely to come up here and try one of these noises and just apply this on your mesh and see if that one's working. Um, another thing with the surface noise that the noises were changed how they handle um, between 4R6 and 4R7. And so in 4R7, the surface noises have gone to a 3D version of the surface noise. So what this means is you're getting a 3D displacement. So if you come up here and click BPR render on Earthquake here. Uh, let me turn off some of these uh, render settings here. So this goes a little bit faster. And turn off this SSS and this wax preview. And render him here and if the surface noise won't you won't see the 3d effect until you render your mesh with surface noise or convert it so that could also be a thing your surface noise may just be not strong enough because it's basically viewing it in a post-process overlay on your model until you apply it so you're going to get a little disconnect between there so the best thing to do to test your surface noise after you have it active like this is to do a bpr render and then that is going to show um, your surface noise on your mesh and unfortunately, I picked Earthquake here <laughs> as the uh, project, and he's got a bunch of materials on him. So he's taking a little bit to uh, render here. I'm actually going to abort this. Well, well, there you go. So there is Earthquake with that actual surface noise applied. And then if you see, if I'm back in the preview mode, this is what I'm getting. So you're going to get a disconnect um, between the surface noise because it's after it's applied, it's going to a 3D version instead of a 2D displacement. Um, if you want to view the surface noise as a 2D displacement, which is how it was in 4R6, if you come over to the render palette here and go to this render properties tab, in here you have a draw noisemaker 3D and if this is on for 3D, it's going to, when you render with BPR, it's going to generate it in that 3D mode. If you turn this off, 
it's going to give you what you see. So it's going to give you more of the 2D bump map tile style of the noise rather than the 3D displacement style. So that again is if you go to render and go to render properties, if you want the 3D noise, make sure this draw Noisemaker 3D is active. If you want the 2D noise, just turn this off. And so that's going to be your toggle between those two. But the 3D noise is quite powerful. And as I was showing with the um, displacement stuff in here, you know, this one's another good one for like offsetting. Um, you can start layering models and using this offsetting effect. And now you can get things like this. So we have like earthquake culled out. Um, with the surface noise and then if you render this as well um, I'm gonna have to switch to a different version of earthquake here one that's a little bit lighter I have one without all his crazy rendering let me just do that quick let's open another project here and we'll show you that dum 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 we'll do the I'll do the sphere and now we'll load in an earthquake without all his crazy lighting So there we go, just toggle him off. And now we'll apply that same surface noise again to him. So I'm gonna open up Lightbox here, go to noise and grab that. And then go back to surface noise and go to edit and we'll do that call out with the offset there. And then hit okay. And now when I render with BPR, you're gonna get this. So you just get this as your result rather than the whole entire earthquake. So you've offsetted some of that noise. All right. so. Let me know if that helps. If not, uh, definitely hit, hit us up on Twitch, Twitter, Twitch and Twitter. I'm going to get those confused. And uh, I'm happy to look at your model. You can also submit a ticket to support, um, and we'll be more than glad to look at the model as well. All right, let's see, let's see. Boom, 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 boom. So we got one about IMM curve brushes and the size. So we can go through this really quick. I see Tomas is answering a question as well here. Let me disable surface noise on my, or actually just let me load another project here. So many projects, so many projects. All right, so when you create an IMM brush, what is happening? So first off, you can create a new brush or an insert mesh brush out of any geometry inside a ZBrush. So if I have this model here and I go up to the brush palette and I go to create insert mesh brush, it's going to take this model and it's going to convert it to an insert mesh. And after you have this insert mesh brush created, and if your model has no subdivisions applied to it, you can come across the surface and now start dragging this part out on your model as an insert mesh. Now, if you have a set of subtools that have multiple subtools, if I come through and start appending some more of these guys here that I have. So now I have three subtools. I now have the ability to come to the brush menu and do a create insert multi mesh. And this is going to take all those subtools and turn them into a single brush that has those three parts inside of it. So I can select that one, and I can see I have a new brush over here. And if I hit M on my keyboard, you can see it now consists of these three parts. So the question was asking about scaling in relation to this, and is there a way to get this scale to have one part be one size and one part to be the other size? And fortunately, there is not. Um, so when ZBrush creates these parts here, what it's doing is it's going to take the part and it's going to unify it when it creates it. So you can have these things all different sizes. I can take this one and position it over here and make it really tiny and then maybe take this one position it over here and make it really tiny so I have all these different kind of sized parts and if I do the same process where I create this insert mesh what ZBrush is going to do it's going to look at every single one of these subtools it's going to basically unify them so that it all fits inside that XYZ scale of 2 inside of ZBrush it's going to position it in the angle you have it and basically get it as flat as possible. So if you have your insert mesh brush like that, that is how it's going to capture that insert mesh brush. So if I create an insert mesh brush with the cylinder like so, when I draw it out, it's gonna come out like that. So you wanna make sure that your angle of how you're viewing your subtools is correct on your canvas because that's gonna determine how the insert mesh brushes draw out when you draw them on the surface.
But the big thing is that it does go through and it unifies all these to be a constant size. So if I come over here and do create insert multi mesh brush again, this is going to give me a, another sub another brush here. And this brush is going to be identical to that one I just created. So if I come back to a sphere 3D here and start drawing these out, they're going to come out at the same level. Now you can lock in a specific size and you can do this by adjusting your draw size. If I change this to say something like 32 and while you're drawing the insert mesh brush out, if you hold down control, it's going to lock that insert mesh brush out at that draw size. So you can see here, this is now locked out at 32. If I change this to 64 and draw it out and hold control, this is now at that draw size of 64. And each one of these, depending on what it is, they will hold in relation to this draw size and control, but it may generate, it's going to still generate a different size. So you can see the 64 of this one and this one are basically the same size, even though I had them as those smaller parts on that file that I created. So it's doing unify before it creates the insert mesh brush. Now you can also, with the insert mesh brush, you can change how much depth it has, and this can be controlled per insert mesh object. So if I come to the brush I have here and I press M, you have these three parts. So if I select the cylinder, right now it's drawing out at this depth. So it's drawing out at a depth that's the maximum height for this tool. If you go to the brush palette over here, you can navigate down to this depth area, and you can see that the embed value is set to 100. So what this means that it's going to put the height of this model and make it in the positive axis so that it's sitting right in the surface. If I want this to embed into the surface, I can change this to zero, and this is going to take that value of 100, and it's going to grab the 50, or the zero right in the center here, and that's where it's going to draw it out. So by changing that depth to zero and now draw it out, I'm going to get something like this. So now I have this part embedded in the surface. So if you want to use insert mesh brushes for 3D printed, Printing, I highly recommend going to the brush palette, changing your embed value so it goes into the surface, and then that's going to save you a lot of headache. If you wanted to reverse what it was, so we had the one that was sticking all the way out, if we want to have it stick all the way in, we can just change this embed value to negative 100, and now we're going to get this result. So you can do that with those things. Now this will be, uh, now this depth value is dependent and can be changed on each individual IMM part, and it will save when you save the brush. So if I press M and I go to the other cylinder here, you can see the depth value for this one is set to 40. So 40 is the maximum height for this one. So if I wanted it to go right on the surface, I can change this to negative 40 and now draw that out and it's going to give me that result. If I want it right in the center, I can change this to zero and now it's going to give me this result. And then the sphere will have another different depth setting here. So this one's at 100 again. And so that one now at zero will let me embed it. And then if I want to save what these depth bedding settings are for this entire brush here, you can just go up to the brush setting here, and you go save as, and you can save that out. Another thing that if you ever want to make an icon uh, for your brush, so say you want to make a great icon for this nifty <laughs> random primitive brush here, you can go to the brush palette here, and there's a select icon button. But if you hold down Alt and click the button, what ZBrush is going to do, it's going to do a render of what you have currently on your screen, and it's going to make that the icon. So you can hold down Alt and then click the Select Icon button, and then that will now make an icon for what you have on your screen. So if I didn't like that angle, I can change it to this. Go to the Brush menu, hold Alt, click Select Icon, and now I have a new icon for that. And this icon will save as your brush as well, so you can just come up here, Save As, and save that out. All right, so I think I'm getting overwhelmed with, uh, as Paul mentioned earlier, it's Tangent Central. Tangent Central. <laughs> so let's go, let's go back to the comments here. Let's see. Oh, my gosh, so much scrolling. You guys are awake this morning. Uh, let's see. Dum, dum, dum. So, so many questions. Zebrish core questions. Jewelry question. Okay, so I want to make a ring with a certain size. Can I measure exactly the diameter inside a Zebrish without doing the basic shape in another app? So you can, um, but what you, well, we can talk about scale. Scale's crazy. It is crazy. 
So first let's talk about briefly how ZBrush handles scale. And so here I just have a cylindrical object. So inside of ZBrush there's two sliders that correlate to what the scale is inside of ZBrush. Let me get rid of it. We'll start with this one. So first we have in the geometry tab here, you have a size area here. And this size has some sliders. So you have an X, Y, Z size, you have an X, Y, and Z. And in general, when you bring anything inside of ZBrush, so if you have a model for another application and you bring it in, what happens is ZBrush is going to take that model, it's going to scale it to have an XYZ size of 2, which is ZBrush's happy size that everything works correctly at. So the brushes handle best at an XYZ size of 2, DynaMesh handles best at XYZ size of 2. That's also what a model unifies to when you click the unify button. So if you have a subtool, you click unify, you're going to notice that the XYZ size is going to go to 2. So when you import a model, ZBrush is going to first set it to that value of 2. And then depending on what your generic units were when that model was exported out of other application and brought in, it's going to take that XYZ value from those generic units, it's going to divide that by this 2, and then it's going to put the correlating values down here in this export scale. So if this is set to 16, and let's say I want to export this out in millimeters, right, to a generic units in millimeters, when you go to the file, when you go to tool export and export out the OBJ for the cylinder, what ZBrush is doing, it's taking the scale, which is 16, it's multiplying it by the XYZ size, which is 2 in this case, and then that is now generating a generic units of 32. So that is what ZBrush is doing with the size. And if you export out of the OBJ uh, menu up here, it's just going to export out generic units. So it's XYZ size, multiplied by scale, and that's going to give you generic units. So if your generic units is 32 and you're importing it back into an application that is in millimeters, that's going to be 32 millimeters. If generic units is 32 and you're importing it into an application that's units are in inches, it's going to be 32 inches. And the OBJ file system, you know, is just generic. So it's just going to have the... Um, uh oh, I'm getting hit with questions. It's just going to have those values stored in it. So that's what's going on there. So if you want to measure things inside of ZBrush here, you can use the transpose line. So you can come up here and activate transpose. And you can take the transpose line, and this will snap to vertices. So you can take this position and this position. And as you draw it out, you're going to get a unit value up here. So my unit right now is set to 20. Now if I do it to this outer length by clicking this to this, you can see this is giving me that 32. So the transpose line is looking at these two sliders here. So it's looking at the size slider and it's looking at this export scale slider. And that is what's giving me this distance. So you can see here it is reading as 32. And so this is now set up in the correct millimeter format. So if I want to measure the inner diameter here, I can take this and drag it out. And you see my inner diameter for this right now, if I was exporting out in generic units of millimeters, would be 19.6 millimeters. So that is one way you can check the scale there. Now, if you want to resize the inner structure here of this, um, what I recommend doing is definitely uh, using the Z Modeler brush, especially at the start of this. And so I can switch to that brush here. And to just kind of resize this, you can use a Q Mesh action with the shift functionality. So I'm going to hover over an edge here. I'm going to go first and assign a new polygroup to this middle area. So I'm going to hover over an edge, press spacebar to go into the Z Modeler med edge menu here. I'm going to change this to polygroup and now I'm going to come across and select one of those edge and click and then I'm going to tap alt to get a different color so you guys can see this and I've just given myself a new polygroup in the center there and the Z-Miler brush likes working on this polygroup type actions so we'll go through and use these as what's going to use you can use these as areas for targets on your mesh to deform just certain things. So I want to scale this out to make this a little bit wider, correct? So I'm going to come through here and I'm just going to hover over poly now, press spacebar to go to the poly action menu here. And I'm, this time I'm going to select polygroup all because that's the only area that has this polygroup color. And now I'm just going to perform a Q mesh action on this poly and it's going to affect the polygroup that is here and then all the other polygroups that are the same color. So this whole ring is going to get affected. So by doing this and clicking and dragging, you're going to see that I'm going to be able to skew in on my mesh like so. This will allow me to create another loop if I wanted to make this thing smaller. But while you're doing this, if you hold shift, it's going to perform a move. And so this right here, we're just Q meshing this 
inner thing here is going to allow me to adjust that inner dimension of that cylinder. So I can come through and check, you know, make this a little bit thinner. Then I can rotate to this view here and grab that transpose line again and just draw that out across. And now I can see what the unit value on that is. So you can come through and do that process. And of course I reset my uh, scale here by accident. There we go. So now we're at 25.6 uh, units across. If you want to lock in the scale and have it prevent what just happened there where it just went back to uh, zero, just save your tool out and when you reopen it, it's going to lock the scale value into. So if you end up changing this, just save your tool out really quick, open it back up, and then I'll lock that scale slider in. All right, let's see. I'm going to go into what we have here. Let me, let me check what the questions are. Questions, questions, questions. High poly to low poly. All right, we can show that. We can show that. So let's see here. We're going to go load up Mr. Trusty uh, Earthquake here. Actually, we may load up a, let's see what I got here. I'll load up this file. All right, so we got a, a head here, and I'm just going to delete the lower subdivision on this, and I'm going to do a little close holes to close the bottom there, and then let's say this is a DynaMesh object. So now this model is a DynaMesh. So you've been going through, you've been sculpting, you've been using DynaMesh, and now you have a mesh like this, and you need to now take this and generate a low resolution version out of it. Um, I'm just gonna go through the fast ways on this. You can use, uh, a z-sphere and do manually retopology in zbrush here um, i'm just going to show you two ways that are a little bit quicker than that because um, that part can get a little time consuming um, and there are some uh, excellent videos already in z classroom on how that process so two things that i do for getting a low resolution mesh on a model is first i need to decide if my model is going to be uh, animated or if it's going to be a static mesh. So if you're doing things like environment topology and you're making a barrel, you're making a crate, um, definitely it's probably not going to have any animation to it. So you can take a model that's high resolution. So let's do this a little bit higher. And let's just smooth this out and read Dynamesh here. So here we have a model that's 876,000 points and that should be roughly about 876,000 polys. And so I want to get this to a game engine. Right? I need a low res cage. I need to make maybe make a texture map out of it. Maybe want to go to substance. You know, there's a whole bunch of different avenues you can take this. But right now it's too heavy. It's an extremely high resolution model. So if the model's not static, one thing you can do is come up here to the Z plugin tab and use Decimation Master. And Decimation Master does an excellent job of holding the edges, uh, coming through and decreasing the amount of topology on your mesh and giving you a really good kind of result. Now the result it gives you is all in triangles, but if you're going to a game world, it's gonna get converted to triangles anyway. So it's not a big deal at that point. Now if you need to animate it, I would not use Decimation Master. I'd say come through and start using Z Remesher. And Z Remesher is gonna look at your sculptural details on your model and try to generate new topology that follows those details. So for this head here, I'm just going to duplicate this and just get a second one. And then I'm going to come down here and I'm just going to Z remesh it at its default state. So I'm just going to keep everything default. Target polygon counts is at 15. And I'm just going to go through and do that. So we had a, a thing come in that if you want to reach the chat, make sure you're going to Twitch directly. So you won't be able to view the chat if you are on the ZBrush Live page. So if you want to see where to answer the, ask these questions, uh, you need to actually go to Twitch and the Twitch URL is twitch.tv www.twitch.tv slash pixelogic. And so that is where the questions are being posted right now for the ZBrush Live here for the Ask ZBrush session. So that is where they're going. So if you have a question, definitely uh, go to the Twitch channel and we'll try to get it answered. We're getting close. We're pretty much, I think we hit, well, we got a little bit less than 30 minutes left. So try to get these answered. So here I have a version of the mesh that's been used with the Z Remesher. And so right now I have low resolution topology 
being generated on this. So it's taken my point count down for the 870,000 polygons, and I'm now down to 28. Now at this point, this is still potentially a little bit high. So the process I like to do is I'll first Z remesher once at the default settings. Then I'll turn off this adaptive setting here and I'll set this to half. And then I'll process with Z remesher again. And this multiple processing on your model, every time you reprocess, depending if you have half, same, or double, it's gonna look at the sculptural details on your mesh again. So since we now have a version like this, we've removed a lot of those high details on the model. And so now it's got a model that's a little bit more simplified to look at, and it's gonna generate different topology on that mesh. So processing your model again with zero mesher is a great way um, to keep doing it. And the result, should be a little bit different every time as well. So you can definitely come through and zero mesh multiple times. So now I've got a little more simplified forms. I'm getting a little bit larger edge loops here. I'm gonna do zero mesher again. And you can start doing this to get your model down to a lower state. So we have a pretty low res version of the mesh. Now there are other things you can do to control how Z Remesher is Z Remeshing your model. There is a brush called the Z Remesher Guides brush that you can select. And this will allow you to add guidelines on your mesh through the curve system inside of ZBrush. And then if you come over here and use this curve strength slider, you can determine how closely you want Z Remesher to use those curves. So 50%, it's gonna use those curves at 50%. But if you have this curve strength strength up to 100, it's gonna try to hold a line of topology exactly where those curves are. Another thing that's good with Z Remesher is using the Keep Groups option. So you can come through and use the Slice Brush on your mesh to establish polygrouping, and then use those polygroups with the Z Remesher to establish seam lines and keep those edge loops as well. So all sorts of uh, different little things you can do with the Z Remesher. Now some things you may still have to manually rebuild. So like I've pretty much lost the eye area here. What I would want to do is I could try to use Z Remesher and go through and draw curves around the eyes to kind of keep that cylindrical shape. Um, for this just quick demo, I'm just going to ignore that for right now. We're going to pretend it made really nice eye sockets for me. And so now that after we have our low resolution uh, version of our mesh, the next thing you probably want to do is generate some UVs on this. And for this, I want to establish just some quick polygrouping for the UV master tool inside of ZBrush here to follow. So right now it would go through and just UV to its heart's content, but I have this kind of cap at the bottom of the neck here. So I wanna give this portion here a new polygroup. And to do this, I'm gonna use the slice brush. So I'm gonna to go to my brush menu, I'm gonna isolate by the letter S, and I'm gonna select the slice curve brush. And then with this brush selected, I can hold control and shift. And you see now I have slice curve. And this is gonna allow me to come through and just cut rows of topology right in my mesh. I can come through and just do this. You can use spacebar to move this around. You can change the angle. You can hold shift to lock it to a specific angle. And once you're happy with where it is at, you can just release. And this will generate a slice right through your model. So it's gonna give you a new cut of geometry all the way through. And now it'll give you a new polygroup on the other side of that. So you can see now I have a new polygroup on the back of this head here. Now, the next thing I want to do is I'm going to navigate up here to the Z plugin tab and I'm going to go to the UV Master tab here. And UV Master is a plugin that ships with ZBrush, which will allow you to generate UVs on your mesh. It works really well for organic shapes. So I can come through here and I can turn on this polygroup option, which is going to respect that polygroup I just added to the bottom of the neck there. I'm going to keep symmetry on since this model is symmetrical. And I'm going to enable this enable control painting. And when you activate this, as long as your model does not have subdivisions, you're going to be able to paint where you want your seams to be. So by turning this on and then selecting one of these buttons here, so I can select Attract, you can now come through on your mesh and paint where you want UV Master to determine a seam line. So I'm going to start from the back of the head here and just drag this down. And let's try that again here. <laughs> we may have to do a... Uh, Let's do, a, let's do a work on clone here. I, I broke something, I think. <laughs> Enable control painting, attract. Oh man, I'm in the Z modeler brush. It's all crazy. It's all sorts of craziness here. I swear this works. <laughs> Tomas is probably like, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. Let's go back to the original one. Look at that, real-time demoing, real-time. All right, enable control painting, attract. There we go. 
So I've just painted this blue line on the back of the model here. And what this is telling UV Master is that this color, which is associated with attract, is going to now try to create a seam line where that color is placed. So it's just giving guidelines for how UV Master is gonna handle. Now if you're done with this, you just simply click Unwrap, and it's gonna go through and unwrap the model. And now if I go down here to the Texture Map tab and do New from UV Map, you're gonna see this is what I've got. So. I had a poly group that I think I just set here with the Z modeler brush, which just totally came in and destroyed these, uh, the mesh here. Let me redo that quick. I totally just Z modeled myself uh, into trouble. So let's draw that uh, control painting again. I'm gonna Z plug in, enable control painting, attract. There we go. Unwrap. There we go. New from UV map. So there we have our UVs on our mesh. Now, after you have these UVs generated on this mesh here, we can now modify these some as well. So we can go back to UV Master. Once again, if you don't have any subdivisions on this, we can now go to Flatten, and this will show us our UVs in a flattened version. From here, I can use masking and just kind of move these around. I can scale these up. So if I want a little more resolution there, I can do that. If I want to take this main part and grab all this, you can also use the Mask by Polygroups option for this. But you can come through and manipulate the UVs in here just with this flatten option. So you move them around, change them. You can smooth things out with just the smooth brush. So if you see like bunching happening, um, just take the smooth brush and smooth it out. And then you can also do like all sorts of other things inside of ZBrush on your UVs in this flattened form. And then after you're happy with this, just come back to the Z plugin UV Master, do an unflatten, and you're going to get back to your model. So now that I have a high resolution version of my mesh here, and I have the low resolution version, I can now project the details to this if I want. So right now I could just export out the low, export out the high, do my baking in any sort of application. Um, if I want to do it inside of ZBrush, I need to now just project my high resolution details back to my low resolution model. So I'm going to have the low resolution one selected. I'm going to start dividing this up. And I usually divide this up to make sure that it's roughly the same resolution as the original. So we're going to try to get around 1 million polygons here. So that's 3 million. We'll do 762. And after you have it divided up, we now just need to make sure we have our original on as well. So we have our low res on and our original has that eyeball icon. Make sure we still have our low resolution one selected. We go to this project option here. I always change my distance slider to 0.1. So by default, this is set to 0.01. I usually set it to 0.1. After it's set there, we're just going to do a project all. And this is going to take the low resolution model and it's going to project those high resolution details back onto it. And depending on how many millions of polygons you have, this could take a little while. As you can see, it was pretty fast there. And now I have this version of the model, which has that topology and those UVs, and it has all those sculptural details. So here's the one that was the new topology, and here's the one with the old topology. And as you can see, as I click back and forth between these, you're not going to see any change in the sculptural qualities. You're only going to see changes in the topology. And so now, if I want to map out of this, I can come down and do like low resolution version here and go to my normal map tab or my displacement map. And then I can just do create normal map. I'm just going to go through and take the high and take the low. And now you're going to get a normal map out like that. If you want the displacement, same property. I usually turn on adaptive. Let me do create displacement map. And I'll go through and generate this map as well. So there is the quick, 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 quick rundown on how to generate some low topology, give it some UVs, project back the high resolution details, and then generate a map out of that. And then this map will now link to that low resolution model, so you can clone it out and send it on its way. So I hope that helps there. All right, going to the questions again. So we have about a little over 10 minutes here. We've got so we'll do this quick one on cutting a straight line into my model as transpose line as a guide. So there's a trick you can do with the transpose line to get this to happen. Um, and then you can use the slice brush in a straight format to kind of get that result. So here I'm going to take uh, let's go with, uh, we'll keep this model. 
So this one right now, if you guys aren't familiar with this too, if you turn on your polyframes and it looks really dense and you don't want to see the lines, you can just disable line and then I'll just show you these nice poly groups on your mesh. It's over here. It's this little tiny text above polyframe. It's fun times. Tiny text. Tiny text. All right. So the question is asking about using transpose line and then adding geometry to a surface based on the angle of the transpose. So let's say you want to take your model and I want to do a slice from here to here and I want to have it like this angle like so. So you could just take the slice brush and eyeball this, but if you want to do it based on a transpose angle, um, basically what you need to do is you can use transpose line to store a angle value here and then you can reposition your model in the ZBrush canvas based on that transpose line and then you can do your slice in a world axis rather than a camera axis. So to do this, just draw your transpose line out and then if you hover over this um, white circle here, you'll see there's some options at the top. And one of these is control and click. I believe this is the happy one. It usually takes me a few seconds here. And when you control click that transpose line, what it's gonna do, it's gonna take that transpose line you drew out and it's going to now take it and put it horizontal on your canvas and take the model with it. So as you can see, now my model is correlating directly with this horizontal transpose line. So let's see if I can do it again. So I'm gonna come here, have my model, have it like this, take that move transpose line, I'm just gonna draw it out. I'm gonna hold shift to make sure it's straight. And I want it, the model to be angled like this now. I can go to the white circle, hold down control and click, and it's now going to rotate the model like so. And so now it's laying correct, directly horizontally based on that transpose line. So now I could come in with the slice curve brush and I could get this and I can now draw a slice curve. And when I draw this out, you can see it's gonna be directly horizontal and I can come through and slice my model like so and get out of that transpose line there. And so there I have that perfect horizontal line based on that transpose. That's probably not exactly what you're looking for, but it may give you a solution um, to kind of work from. Uh, splitting a model for 3D printing, we can talk about that quick as well. So we'll take our, our trusty head here, We're still using trusty head. And yeah, we should be good. So let's say I have this model and I want to print it really big. And my bed of my 3D printer looks something like this. So let's go with that. Too many models, too many models. So I'm going to take this and move you out here and I'll scale you up some. And we're going to scale sideways here. And we'll scale this way. So we're just making a, we're making a printer bed here. A little printer beds, making some cubes. There we go. For some reason that's your that's your printer bed. And I'm just going to center this back to the world. So I'm going to the geometry tab here. I'm going to go to position. I'm just going to zero all this out. So now that's in the center of the world there. So let's say I want to print this head here, and this is what I'm looking like. So I have this here, and I have my printer beds about that big. We're going to make it a little bit bigger because I only want to do one slice on this. And so I can print the top of the head and then I'll make it a little bit bigger and the bottom of the head. So I'm just going to split this model into two to get it the size I want. So how can I do that inside of ZBrush here? So the first thing I'd recommend doing is that if you want to hollow your model to do your hollowing now before you do your slicing. And to hollow a mesh, we basically just need to set a subtool to subtract or use an insert mesh brush in a subtraction mode to generate a hole. And then we can populate the interior space of that. So I'm going to take this model here and I'm just going to append in another cylinder here for it. And where are you at, cylinder? So tiny, cylinder. <laughs> if you ever append something and it's a little bit too small, you can always just unify the uh, one you appended. And then you can then, from there, do your rotations and your movement and size it down as needed. And if you're sizing stuff down and you run into this, where it's like, I can't get any smaller, just size it down once, and then you can press one on your keyboard, and I'll repeat that, and it'll allow you to uh, size it down a little bit more. So I'm gonna take this, and I'm just gonna put this in the neck here. So I wanna punch a hole right through there, so I'm just gonna haul this out really quick. So there we go. 
And then here I'm gonna go back to my model, make sure she still has Dynamesh active. So I'm gonna geometry, Dynamesh, Dynamesh is still active here. I'm just gonna move her down to the bottom. So I'm gonna hold shift and then press this move down option. And that's gonna take that and just put it right at the bottom. And then I'm gonna grab the cylinder and move that down. So it's directly below it. The cylinder shape, I'm gonna to set to this subtractive option. So now I have my main head and I have the cylinder shape below it set to subtractive. I'm gonna do a merge, merge down. And what this is going to do, it's going to merge the two together. And if I turn my polyframes on here, you're gonna see that the part that was set to that subtractive form has been given this white polygroup. And what this is telling ZBrush is that the next time I do a Dynamesh or re-Dynamesh on this, it's going to subtract that part out. So instead of subtracting that, we want to use it as a area where we can start hollowing this mesh out. So we can go back to the Design Mesh tab here. And in here, we can do this Create Shell. So I'm going to set my thickness to, uh, we'll try 10. And do Create Shell on this. And this is now going to look at that cap. It's going to punch that out and then shell the rest of the model. Now this process never fails. Never. It may take a while, but I have never had this process fail. So if it sits here and it just takes a little while to do, it will finish. It will finish. And depending on your thickness, it could take a little bit of time because just calculating that inner surface of the mesh here. And I didn't uh, test this model <laughs> before doing this, so this could be a little bit of a time thing here. So many of you guys awake now. 327 of you guys are up. You guys are crazy. Oh. Yes, these videos will stay on this here, and I think they will also be going to our YouTube channel as well. So here we go. So that process finished. Now I have this nice hollowed version of the model here. And I should be able to isolate that inner part, which it's not letting me right now. But there we go. My mesh is hollowed. So if you're doing a lot of printing, you probably want to save resin materials. If you're doing FDM stuff, just go ahead and print it solid. It's going to make the interior stuff all by itself. But if you're going to split up your model and it needs to be hollow, do your hollowing first and then do the split. So now I have my mesh. It's still in Dynamesh there. It has this nice hollowed area in the center. And now I'm going to go back to my trusty bed cube here. And I'm going to put that down below here. And I know my bed's going to be, you know, one size and the other side. So this is the, same, the exact size, let's say, of my bed, exact same ratio. And now I just want to make the other aspect as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this box, I'm going to use the Z modeler brush, and I'm just going to create a top face as well on top of this, just engulf the entire head. So I'm going to hit B on my keyboard. I'm going to go to the Z modeler brush by isolating by Z and then hitting M. And I'm going to solo this box quick. I'm going to hold down Alt, and this is going to give me this alternate polygroup with Z modeler. And I'm just going to tag these top faces here. And then with this, I'm going to hover over poly. I'm going to change my target to a single poly. And I'm just going to drag this out. And I just want to make sure that it engulfs the top of the head there. So now I should have a box and, if I get out of solo here, a head. So this is what I got going on here. You can come through and you can delete this extra loop here if you want. You can delete all these loops if you want. There you go. So now we have a really low polygonal model of our bed, right? And I have it so it's engulfing the mesh. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to make sure that I have one of these tools that looks like this and the other tool looks like this. And then I'm going to do subtractions on my mesh to get the two halves. So I'm going to take this and I'm just going to duplicate it. So I have cube one and cube two. Cube one, I'm going to just remove that top that I just added. And then cube two, I'm going to just remove the bottom. So now I have cube one and I have cube two. So I got this item going on here. I'm going to give cube two its own poly group so you can see this a little better. And then I have my head. So I've got head, cube one, cube two. Now I'm going to duplicate head. So I have two of these. Head's always already been hollowed out. Just to get your order here, I'm going to move this down so it's in between the two cubes. And then for the one cube, I'm going to set the subtractive. And then for the other cube, I'm going to set it subtractive. And now I'm doing the same process I just did, but instead of doing the shelling, I'm just going to do redynamesh. So take head one here. That's hollowed. Merge down. Now I'm going to end with this. So I got that white cube. I can now just redynamesh. And now what this is going to do, it's going to subtract that white polygroup away. And I'm left with this, with that nice hollowing. Cube two, do the same. Take the head, do a merge down. Redynamesh. And there we have our second part. 
So now I have both these tools. If I turn them both on here and get out of transparent and move them, now I have my model sliced up. And both these parts should fit into that bed volume. And now I can print both these, and now I have the two halves of my head. So that is the process that I would suggest doing for printing uh, 3D models. Uh, just make sure always that you do your hollowing first, because um, that's going to, when you do the second DynaMesh subtract here, it's going to give this and still keep that hollowing form. If I didn't hollow it first, I would now have to go through and re-hollow each of these parts, and I would have a flat area there. So you can definitely come through and uh, fix that as well. You can add your keys now too if you want. You just do more subtractives off the top of the bottom. Um, and that will continue kind of growing on this process that I just showed you guys. So I hope that, hope that answers that one. Oh, so let's see here. What we got in time? So we got one minute. So I'm going to do one more here quick that we have. And then you guys are going to be on... To the next stuff so let's see here so we had a question about expressions using layers so let's go to mr earthquake now i don't i don't pretend to do uh expressions <laughs> i usually don't do them all that much so this could be an awful 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 demo here so basically, we're going to use layers here, and layers will allow you to basically store morphs of your tool. And the more layers you have, the more of these morphs you can store, and then you can toggle them on and off to get certain expressions and stuff. So I'm going to go to the layer palette here and just open this up, and I'm first just going to add a layer. And this layer is going to come in added, and it's going to automatically put in this record mode. And so while this layer is in record mode, and come through and now start, say, getting the move brush here on Earthquake, and I can start deforming Earthquake. So we're going to come through here. Maybe we'll mask out his. Let's get the mask lasso here. Let's not make this look like total garbage. <laughs> well, it's going to look like total garbage, but we're going to do it with a little more style. Give him that lip close. Maybe his chin got really weird for a sudden. And then we come through. He's raising that eyebrow up a little bit. His eye got really big. Maybe his ear gets really big. So maybe he's mutating, right? So now this is stored as a layer, right? So we can turn this off. Now we have this version of Earthquake in a layer. So I can toggle the eyeball over here, and there's normal Earthquake. There's crazy Earthquake. There's normal Earthquake. There's crazy Earthquake. And we can add another one of these. So I can take the same thing, add it again. Now I have a new layer, and this time we can do something a little bit different here. So let's mask this out. Let's make his mouth a little bit more open. And there are all sorts of uh, better ways to do this masking <laughs> that will hold the details here. And I'm getting my poly paint because I've got my RGB only set to smooth. No one wants that. So maybe now this eye goes crazy. And then maybe his nose gets really big. There you go. Look how pretty he is. So now I have a second layer on this. So now if I get out of recording mode again... I've got, let me turn off my poly paint and go back to my layers. I've got layer one and layer two. And now I can just come over here and I can switch in between these to get these different earthquake expressions. Now these will also combine on themselves. So if I have layer one on and layer two on, I'm now even getting more crazy expressions. So you can also add these on top of each other. And once these are added too, you can also change the strength of these with this intensity slider here. And you can turn this up or down and now you can make them go so all sorts of uh, different things you can do <laughs> with layers inside of ZBrush. And so if you think of them as like morph targets, um, it's going to help you. So now I can make them wink. I always want an earthquake winking. A small, small eared and winking. <laughs> all right, guys. <laughs> so it looks like we are out of time uh, for this segment here. So this is gonna be a reoccurring event. And if you guys check the schedule, which is directly below this video here, and we'll come over and let me, let me pull that up again as well. So you guys know where this is coming from. Let's get my, my switcheroo here. And go back to the Chrome. All right, so thank you all for coming out today. And uh, 
participating in ZBrush Live. I hope you guys learned some things. If you have any other questions related to Ask ZBrush stuff, be sure to use Twitter and send your questions that way. I will be doing videos on some of the ones that are already there this week. So there definitely will be one recapping the changing the UI that I answered originally in this session. So that will be done this week. And then I have a few others that are on my list here that I will be doing. So if you want to add any more of those, uh, definitely use uh, Twitter and the Ask ZBrush hashtag and ask away. Uh, the today, coming later at 6 p.m. LA time, we have Michael Pavlovich. We'll be doing some sculpting stuff. Excellent uh, ZBrush instructor, excellent artist as well. So definitely tune into his. You'll get a whole boatload of more ZBrush information to use in your creations. And then later on, for all you crazy night owls, uh, we have the people, the craziness from New Zealand happening again. So we got 3D sculpting for figurine production with John Troy Nickel. So definitely tune in for that. And and once again, we're just starting this off this week. We hope to keep this as a continuing thing and keep this channel flooded with ZBrush related stuff constantly. So if you guys would like to be in our rotation of Ask ZBrush, or just rather ZBrush Live artists, if you go to this broadcast calendar here, there is a creatives apply here and you can apply to be a participant in our channel and this will allow you to get a time slot and then your name can appear here and you can demo zbrush stuff for hours on end oh it's so exciting so that is it so i hope you guys had a decent time thanks for waking up early on the east coast over here really early in la time um and coming out that's it um hope that helped and happy zbrushing <laughs>